I'm very pleased to be able to join you virtually. Um, I wish I could be there in person. Uh, I will tell you that um, though I only spent a year at Berkeley, I miss the amazing weather and culture and place uh, every day. Um, I also should should thank um, uh, right off the bat my frequent co-author Paul Pearson, who is at UC Berkeley. Uh, Paul and I uh, did not write the Great Risk Shift together, but uh, most of our, our most of my work has been jointly authored with him, and he's influenced my thinking a great deal. So I, I'm going to share my slides here, but before I do, I, I, I just want to say that I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, and I'm told that I should speak for only 30 minutes, um, which is not a long time for an academic. And whenever I'm faced with a time constraint, I'm reminded of an evaluation that I received when I was a new assistant professor at Yale. And it, it began with great promise. It said, Professor Hacker, if I had just 15 minutes to live, I'd want to spend it in your class. Because that way it would seem like an hour. Uh, so I hope I hope the next uh, 30 minutes uh, and the conversation to follow seems pretty close to the actual time. So let me share my screen. Hold on a sec. Today's talk is really going to build on the book that Christina mentioned, The Great Risk Shift. I wrote it back in 2006. Um, in 2019, I published a second edition of the book um, with updated data and information. Um, the first book came out right on the eve of the Great Recession, um, the greatest economic downturn since the Great Depression. Uh, the second book came out right on the eve of the pandemic, the greatest pandemic uh, and, and health crisis we'd faced uh, since the swine flu pandemic. So I promise you I will not write another edition of the book just to ensure that we don't face some kind of cataclysmic event in the future. Um, but it actually was, the timing was actually, um, uh, what's the right word, appropriate. Um, because of course, it's my been... pleasure to introduce Drs. Christina Harknett and uh, the timing was was appropriate because of course the great uh, great recession really bit laid bare the um, the the risks that workers are facing uh, due to what I called the great risk shift and just as the pandemic has laid bare many of the deep inequalities and risks that workers are facing today. Okay. That's, I have no financial interest or relationships to disclose. Um, so here's my agenda and I'll, um, and I'll move quickly through the first part and a little more slowly through the second. So first I wanna talk a little bit about why the United States experienced such a massive shift of risk. Um, we are unusual among rich democracies in the structure of our social programs and in the way in which employers operate. And you can't understand the great risk shift, which is in substantial part distinctive to the US without understanding that. Uh, and in particular, I want us to understand something that I've spent a lot of my career studying, namely why the US came to rely so heavily on, uh, on workplace benefits. Then I'll talk about the risk shift itself, um, and I want to be uh, clear that there has been some important there have been some important developments pushing the other way, and the most notable of those is the Affordable Care Act. And then I want to talk a little bit about why that uh, the Affordable Care Act has coexisted with continuing uh, erosion of, of many kinds of social protections uh, through a politics that, uh, that is not like an act of retrenchment, but more like what I call drift, uh, where policy is not being updated to reflect changing social circumstances. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the current uh, political debates and, and where we may, might yet go. So that's an ambitious agenda. Let me uh, jump right in. So the welfare state is a contested term, and I only want to introduce it as a term because, um, because it's, it's uh, really important to understand that the US has an unusual structure compared with other rich democracies. So the, the term itself comes actually from, the, from Britain. It was a term that was meant to describe the positive British welfare state versus the Nazi warfare state. And until the 1960s and 70s, welfare itself was often uh, seen as a word that, that every politician wanted to be associated with. Um, and the landmark legislation that established the public welfare state we have is the Social Security Act of 1935. Now, what's important to understand is the Social Security Act set out core programs like unemployment insurance that with modification exist to this day. It did not importantly include some of the programs that other rich democracies uh, now have. And in some of those areas, we have not seen much movement. And part of the reason is that the United States came to rely 
much more heavily uh, on private benefits. Um, and this we sort of miss often, because if you think about the welfare state, um, most people will divide it into three core components. And this would include social insurance programs, things like uh, national health insurance and uh, public pensions, means-tested or anti-poverty benefits. So this is everything from cash to other forms of assistance that are given to people who have low incomes. And then, and this is a kind of more ambiguous category, social services that are provided on a, on a non-market basis. And in most rich democracies, for example, uh, there is a public paid leave, which is more of a social insurance program, as well as in many publicly funded childcare. Education is um, often seen as part of the welfare state, um, but that's a, not as, as crucial to the definition as uh, for some. So why is this unusual? The US came to rely very heavily on what I call in my work, private social insurance. And I use the term social insurance very uh, um, deliberately here because the private benefits that employers uh, once provided were really a form of social insurance. They did not charge different uh, premiums to different people uh, based on their risk. They often pooled risk at the employment level and often at the industry level as well. Um, so they were social insurance, but they were not provided by government like Medicare. And this is uh, really, I think, uh, the starting point for thinking about what's different about the American welfare state. So we have very good social benefits compared with other countries, or at least strong social benefits compared for other, with other countries for the elderly in the form of Social Security and Medicare. But, um, but our social programs um, uh, uh, are not as complete in other areas. And it should be said that while we spend a lot on these programs, both as a share of the economy and as a share of the budget, we actually spend a lot less on social benefits than most rich democracies do as a share of our economy. Um, and that's one reason why this, this spending tends to produce a lot less um, inequality and uh, poverty reduction than do the spend, does the spending in other countries. You remember I mentioned that welfare once was not a pejorative term. Well, it became a pejorative term in the 60s and 70s. And, and as it did, it became really highly racialized. And so means-tested benefits, benefits for the poor in the United States are, are quite distinctively associated with um, race in a way that is unusual, if not uh, unique, among rich countries. And then the last thing is there's a huge, what uh, sometimes is called hidden welfare state of tax breaks, uh, as well as these private sector uh, tax breaks for, um, for home ownership, tax breaks for education and, and retirement savings, and actually tax breaks for the, the benefits that employers provide. Um, and so we actually spend a lot. Um, if you look at these tax breaks and you look at private spending, we actually spend, as I'll show you in a minute, more than almost every other country. But the way that we spend it tends to have distinctive distributional consequences. It tends to be less uh, risk spreading and income redistributive. And it, it tends to be uh, a lot less available for those with lower wages or uh, those who are not white. So here's what I was saying. The US um, has a very large uh, private social uh, set of private social benefits and uh, larger than in any other rich country. And you can see that if you add those in and take into account taxes, we actually spend more than any other country um, besides uh, besides France. Um, so <clears throat> my students are always interested in understanding why. Why did this system develop the way it did? And um, hold on one sec. I'm staying another night. My students are often interested in, in understanding why the system developed this way. And there are basically three common arguments that get made. One is that the US is less trusting of government. Um, and there's certainly a big element of truth to that. Um, but perhaps more important is the United States has not had uh, the same kind of uh, uh, a social democratic labor um, presence that other countries did, particularly at the time of the development of the welfare state in the 1930s. Um, labor was just growing in power at that time. And of course, as I mentioned, we have much greater racial cleavages in the United States. And the, the, this makes it both harder to build 
power for 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 risk spreading and uh, egalitarian policies, but also uh, undercuts the solidarity among workers that makes it easier to build support for them. Um, but I would add to this that our political institutions, as we're seeing today, make it really hard to do big things. And it wasn't until the 1930s that the national government had power to move in these areas. And even then it was constrained. And you can see today, right, how hamstrung our political system can be, especially when parties are polarized. And partly because of this late and distinctive development, the United States really went down a distinctive historical path. So that's uh, what social scientists would call this path dependence. Um, and I'll give you an illustration of that um, because I think it's really important to understand that it's not just that you head down a distinctive path, but that once you go down it, it's really hard to get off it. Um, so look at the difference here between public and private pension coverage. This is retirement pensions and public and private health insurance coverage, right? So in the United States prior to the Great Depression, um, there wasn't much activity at the federal level, but you can see right after the 1930s and 40s, there are, we already had a social security system that was covering about half the population and it expanded essentially to cover everyone. Private pensions did emerge among employers. Some had predated the Great Depression, but they emerged on large scale after the Social Security Act, but they largely initially built on top of social security and thereby reinforced it. Um, the same was not true with health insurance, right? Notice that the gray here, which is private health insurance, expanded dramatically before the government stepped in with Medicare and Medicaid. And it's been very hard for us to get off that predominantly private pass since. In a sense, the United States, uh, we are the only country basically that passed national health insurance for old people. And if you think about it, that's not an easy foundation to build on, right? Other countries started with hospital services and then moved to physician services, or they started with working people and then moved to the whole population. We started with old people who aren't in the labor market, leaving private health insurance to basically cover those who are working. And of course, the private health insurance is not covering those who are working to the extent it once was. So this is where the great risk shift comes in. So since the 1960s and 70s, we've not seen a major expansions of social benefits with, the, uh, with a few notable exceptions, and the most notable being the Affordable Care Act. And um, the result is that our public social programs have grown more, th more threadbare but they have remained largely in place. Um, the big exception is uh, the, the, um, the, the 1996 um, uh, reform of, of welfare, um, the, a, a, then the Aid to Families with Dependent Children program and its replacement with the Temporary Assistance for Needy Pro Families program or TANF. But Social Security has been attacked but has remained intact. Uh, Medicare has been reformed but has remained robust. Uh, if uh, more threadbare, um, and, and a lot of other benefits uh, have followed a similar trajectory. However, the private benefits that employers provide have been radically retrenched. And part of this is because labor unions, which grew in the 1940s to cover roughly <clears throat> a third of the workforce, declined dramatically after the 1970s. Part of it is because of the employment market, uh, <clears throat> the corporate world changed itself with companies coming under much greater financial pressure to uh, trim their costs and their workforce. And this, of course, went hand in hand with the growing uh, uh, globalization of the labor market as well. But, um, <clears throat> but it's important to note that this great risk shift um, played out differently in different areas. Um, and the two big areas that where employers were, pro were providing very generous benefits were healthcare and pensions. So let's look at each of those. Now, with regard to pensions, um, the share of workers who have a, a, a retirement plan at their place of work has declined. And it's, uh, as you can see, it's much lower for um, African-Americans and Latinos. And, the decline is really pretty dramatic if you if you think about it, right? It used to be that more than half of workers of, of white workers would have a pension plan at their place of work, and now it's around a third. Um, but the real change, or the, perhaps the most fundamental change, is that not, that even workers who are getting retirement plans are getting plans that look totally different from the social insurance plans that they got uh, after World War II, just after World War II. So those retirement plans basically offered a defined benefit 
uh, usually on a monthly basis for the remainder of your life. Starting, however, in the early 1980s, uh, building on um, the uh, an, a very little notice provision in the tax code, um, employers uh, uh, started to offer so-called defined contribution plans, which are really not pension plans, as that was once understood. They're really retirement accounts sponsored by employers, and they place all the risk and responsibility onto workers themselves. And um, and this was really important because. Congress had basically created a set of rules for defined benefit pensions that made them very close to a public benefit. But because of the fact that employers found this out in defined contribution plans, defined benefit plans uh, started to dramatically decline um, and uh, be replaced by defined contribution plans. And over this period, we've seen more and more risk uh, uh, transferred onto workers who really have to uh, save uh, and, and, and make investment choices on their own. Uh, and most of them, let's just be clear, uh, don't save enough or make investment choices that are um, safe enough for them to retire comfortably. So I said that there is a big exception and it is one that I know pretty well because um, as I'll say in a moment, I was very much involved in this debate. Um, in fact, I was out in California at the time and so I spent an, an, um, way too much of my time of my time in the beautiful state of California actually getting on an airplane and flying over to DC right now. Um, the Affordable Care Act uh, was uh, Barack Obama's signature achievement um, in perhaps the most endearing moment uh, that uh, of, of Biden's political career. He was caught on a hot mic calling it the FB. Um, it was. Um, and um, and it's important to recognize both how dramatic its effects have been and how it built on and really continued many of the features of the, of the divided welfare state that the United States has. Now, I said I was involved in this debate, so my contribution was to develop the so-called public option. Um, and this was the idea of allowing workers to buy into um, a Medicare-like plan um, rather than just having a choice of private plans if they didn't have coverage through their employers or through Medicare or through Medicaid. Um, needless to say, as you all know, uh, or, 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 or may not know, but that's itself telling, um, it didn't make it into the final legislation. And when it was stripped out, um, the key senator who was, a, who was opposed was uh, my uh, home state senator now, uh, because I had moved back to uh, to to uh, to New Haven, Connecticut, uh, by December 2009, um, my home state senator uh, Joe Lieberman, who um, who did a kind of form of reverse constituency service in calling me out um, when uh, the uh, when when he decided to oppose it, um, and. Uh, you know, I have to say this was a very difficult moment for me. Um, I uh, was obviously very gutted that the that the public option was not included, but I also I was I was all I was very distraught um, that Joe Lieberman had based his decision on what I uh, supported. I had thought at this point that maybe I should have supported some other things so that Joe Lieberman could be against them. You know, like the Iraq War. But I digress. Okay, so the Affordable Care Act had an enormous effect. And I, I think that we can downplay this because, of course, it's not dealt with the, the huge and continuing rise in healthcare costs. It's not dealt with the gaps that still exist in the system, particularly for those who were left out because the, the um, Supreme Court decided to make the Medicaid, the Medicaid program expansion optional for the states. But it covered millions more Americans, right, bringing down the share of Americans uh, with uh, 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 with health insurance dramatically, right? And you can see here that it did that without causing employers to drop coverage. So you can see that prior to the Affordable Care Act, the great risk shift was was uh, massively uh, cutting the, sh the 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 number of Americans who were getting health insurance from their employers, and that actually has ticked up since then. But the real story, right, is the millions of Americans who gain new coverage through Medicaid or through the so-called marketplaces. Um, and this has continued, right, even without the so-called individual mandate, which has been the source of so much of the controversy over the Affordable Care Act. So I think we should consider this a great achievement, but obviously, an, uh, or at least I believe, an incomplete achievement. And, and the main reason it's incomplete achievement is that you can't have a stable health insurance system if costs continue to rise fast, 
much, much faster than our economy or than, and especially than the wages of ordinary workers. And that's what's happened. And here, I think it's really important to understand that one of the reasons that we have private spending that's so high um, and total spending that's as high as any country but France is that we have the most wantonly inefficient health, uh, health insurance system in the world. Um, and we spend massively more for healthcare, mostly because the prices for individual services are much, much higher. And so you can see that in this figure um, uh, from, uh, from the OECD, from the Kaiser Family Foundation using OECD and national health expenditure data. You know, that is a huge gap, right? We're talking about multiple percentages of GDP um, between these countries. And because it's a cumulative, right, because there's a, a compound quality to healthcare inflation, it's a gap that's growing over time. So we need to figure out how to deal with this, or we're going we're, we're gonna to have a very hard time sustaining even the gains of the Affordable Care Act. And that's just one of the areas where Unfortunately, inaction is not an option. It may be the preferred uh, or it may be the outcome of, of our increasingly of our, of our stalemated polarized political system, but we have to understand that, that inaction drift is not neutral. And especially in a context in which, as Ed was saying at the outset, workers are facing new and intensified risks. So the, the nature of work has changed fundamentally over the last uh, generation uh, in ways that I discussed uh, in this slide, uh, but our social protections have not changed fundamentally, right? With the exception of the uh, of the creation of the Affordable Care Act, we've seen real stalemate in so many areas and, and regression in some. And I want to highlight something that I read about a lot in the Great Risk Shift and which has not been as much at the center of discussion until recently, which is the way in which changes in the role of women in society and in families has changed the risks that uh, parents and kids are facing. And to me, this is at least as important as the change, uh, the, labor, the labor market story that we talk about more often, namely the gigification of the economy, the decline of unions and, um, and the decline of manufacturing. Um, and they're not of course separate from each other, but the fact is, is that we saw during the pandemic in particular, um, that there are just intense risks that surround the work-family balance. Um, and, and of course, caring not just uh, for children in the work-family balance, but for parents as well, um, elder care as well. And that's, I think, something that um, really highlights that drift has occurred in the US, but not in other rich democracies. So here's a list from a recent paper about a silent revolution in um, family policy and rich OECD countries. You do not need to read all of this. What you need to see here is that the United States is the only country here where the description of change is no change. There's nothing, right? Um, and all these other countries have seen massive shifts, um, uh, more or less massive shifts in policy. Um, and, um, and these policy changes have, have ranged from the expansion of existing paid leave programs to the creation of universal public childcare uh, to, um, to the expansion of family allowances. And in, you know, again, the United States is, is it, 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 there is here not a silent revolution, there is no revolution. And the fact that there hasn't been a revolution means all of these risks have basically been accumulating uh, and, and piling onto families uh, and, and workers rather than being shared broadly among citizens. So you can see that to some extent when you look at large income drops. So I started my work on the Great Risk Shift with this startling finding, at least to me, that the United States had experienced, was experiencing larger and larger income volatility, even though, as I soon discovered, this was not the story in other rich democracies. Here's a picture that is just giving you a sense of some of the cross-national evidence. Um, so this is just whether people experience a 20, whether an individual experiences a 25% or greater drop in their income, and this is their family income. Uh, and so it's basically adjusted for household size. And, um, and you can see that the chance that, a, that an, an individual would experience such a drop was about 15% in 1985, and now is over, uh, tw was no, over 20% in 2010. We have not been able to develop uh, up-to-date estimates of this, but I can tell you that it declined a bit 
uh, in the 2010s, and then has, of course, it's going to have spiked uh, dramatically in recent uh, years. The big story here is just how similar the other countries look. They do not have a big change, and their chance of large income drops is about half uh, or less of ours. Um, most notable to me here is Canada, right? We're supposed to have a very similar economy to Canada, but not only does it have universal health insurance, but apparently it does not have the same kind of income volatility that Americans face. I should note, this is not shown here, that this is a problem that is faced particularly by those lower on the economic ladder and non-white workers. So the pandemic really, uh, laid bare those gaps. I mean, not only did it show us the extent to which our absence of movement on family policy, we are literally the only rich democracy and really almost the only country above a sort of minimum standard of living that doesn't have uh, some kind of paid leave, universal or near universal paid leave program. Um, and, um, but we see, uh, we what we saw, I think most starkly, at least I saw was the racial and and, weight and, and income differences and exposure to risk. So the risk of dying is obviously the one that's most salient to people, but I should just note here, these are the risks here of, of losing um, of, uh, of, of, of unemployment. And you can see that the, you know, that the, uh, the top wage quartile, which is the kind of um, the aquamarine color at the top, experienced a very modest decline in uh, employment compared with the bottom wage quintile, right, which is the purple here, right, just a stepwise down the income ladder, right. So this was not a, a pan the pandemic did not affect all Americans equally, not even close. So a year ago, um, I was, uh, I would be giving this talk with a little more hope in my voice, uh, because I think that the Build Back Better vision, we'll, we'll call it um, that right now, um, that sort of brought together key priorities within this larger agenda that Biden and congressional Democrats were pushing was really designed in many ways to kind of close many of the gaps in, and bring us up, if you will, to the kind of international standard in many areas. Um, I don't note here, you can see some of the, the spending areas, that this spending, although it was a very spending-centric program, it also included um, uh, measures to, cry, to encourage labor unions um, and regulatory changes, uh, other regulatory changes governing the market. But the big thing that I think everyone took away from the debate was that this was going to be a, a, a program that was going to basically invest dramatically in, um, in paid leave, in pre-K, in, um, in this expanded child tax credit, which is essentially now, or was, uh, because it's expired, an American family allowance in improvements of the Affordable Care Act, as well as of Medicaid and Medicare. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, it's a hard conversation to have right now. I am in DC actually doing interviews with policymakers for an academic project. And um, people are in various stages of uh, of the sort of seven stages of grief. Some though remain at the denial stage and might be correct that there's something that can get through. However, we know that's gonna be a lot more modest and, and than, than anything that was envisioned uh, a year ago. And to me, it really drives home that this is, this is not gonna be something that is gonna be um, brought to us in the way that say the New Deal was. Um, and that's partly because that's partly because our politics has changed, right? I mean, uh, FDR had enormous majorities, right? A a as well as a, a nationwide crisis to work with. And, um, and that's just not happened. That's not, that's not the reality today. Um, that said, I mean, I wouldn't say that it's because Pre you know, President Biden has grown unpopular. He got awfully close, right? He got within a couple of votes of getting through a really, a really ambitious agenda, um, despite the fact that his popularity was declining uh, in substantial part, I think, because of the continuing economic and health strains of the pandemic. But if you're asking me, how do we move forward? I think we have to do two things. First, we have to recognize the problem. So that's what this talk is about. Um, we really have to understand that the, the United States has experienced this massive shift of risk. And the only way that we're going to you know, revive our economy and the standing of workers 
is to address it uh, uh, and, and understand, understand it and address it. And so that's the second thing is we really need to think about how to move forward. I'm, you know, my small contribution to this, the idea of the public option uh, remains something I hope will happen. I do think that what we've seen in the past is that you need to have deep movements that are pressing for, for social reforms. And um, historically, that's been the labor movement. Um, and there was a really a lot of organizing, not just within the labor movement, but across a whole set of groups, including those involved with uh, the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020. You know, my hope really rests in the idea that if we have understanding of the problem and ideas for addressing it, then it's this popular mobilization that will really bring us to the point where we can address it. And I will say, and this is, I think, really important to understand, is that these, these policies are overwhelmingly popular. For most part, people understand that they're at greater risk in their lives um, and that they want to have government on their side. They don't have much trust in government, you know, an exacerbation of that longstanding antitrust, but, um, but they really do believe that it is the public sector's responsibility, our democracy's responsibility to help us deal with risks that we can't deal with on our own. So if there is, I think, a prospect for reversing the great risk shift, it lies in the regaining of that sense of common purpose that once animated our social programs and could do so yet again. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Dr. Hecker, um, just really pleased that you were able to kick off our two-day conference with your talk and uh, extremely important things that you've pointed out uh, that all of us attending this conference need to be aware of and to be thinking about uh, how we can help you uh, help move this forward as well as in our own ways, in our, in our own roles uh, as academics, practitioners, advocates, and activists, I, I just think it's great. Um, we have some time for follow-up uh, questions. And just to remind everyone, you can put your question in the Q&A uh, box uh, and I will convey those uh, to Dr. Hacker for the time that we have. Um, let me go ahead and ask one of the Q&A questions. Uh, this comes from Richard Scotch. Uh, he asks, can you comment further on the impact of the risk shift and other workplace workforce changes you discuss for people with disabilities? Great question. Yeah, so I will say that this, um, this is another area where our social norms and realities have changed, but our policies have largely remained stuck in the past. Um, and I, I say that despite fully acknowledging that the Americans with Disabilities Act was a, just a fundamental civil rights breakthrough. But if you think about what's necessary to achieve that promise, it can't just be you know, that you can uh, you know, have enforcement of, uh, of, of, of sort of non-discrimination laws. You need to have a set of, of a systems in place that make it possible for um, disabled people to be full partners in the economy. Um, I, um, I think there are two areas where this really is crucial. One that um, I've become more aware of as I've worked on the public option is the area of long-term services and support. And when I was, uh, there's a, a new version of the public option that was introduced jointly by Rosa DeLauro and Jan Schakowsky called Medicare for America. And um, I, I think it's the best version that's out there of uh, kind of how a public option would work in the current system. And um, we, 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 or I should say Rosa and her staff, to be fair, worked really closely with, the, um, with those in the disability rights and disability community to try to make sure that it had a core focus on long-term services and support. And uh, I was really pleased by, by how much progress was made in thinking through that crucial area. I also think that was a crucial part of the discussion that kind of got buried of care infrastructure um, within the context of the Build Back Better legislation. The other area, and there could be many more I could talk about, but the, um, but the other area where we've seen a real, I think a real shift of risk has to do with disability insurance. Now, it's funny that I would say that in a context in which disability insurance has actually expanded. But I think we know that the disability insurance is still, is still a program that, that suffers from really serious flaws. Um, and its expansion is, uh, in, in a lot of ways is, is both, uh, is both a, a boon, but also 
portends real problems, I think, and, and including the question of whether or not the current program has is set up in a way where it's it, that it's able to continue to offer the benefits it's offering. So there are two things that are really striking, right? One is that with the, with uh, disability insurance, it's a kind of it's a kind of black or white classification. And the reality is that there are many people who could be supported in the workplace um, and uh, for who who really have to make this binary choice. It's also true that disability insurance, not just in the U.S. and other countries, has become a kind of dis program for displaced workers who who are who also have health problems. But again, those workers should be able to be able to remain in the labor force and we really should have a better set of policies that encourage that and um, which would also address the concerns people have about disability insurance's long-term structure but the other thing and i think this is um this is also really fundamental is that disability insurance drives home the extent to which it's health insurance that is the problem right so the fact that you can get medicare coverage when you get a complete disability right but you can't often get medicaid coverage or medic certainly not medicare coverage if you're not in that class all in that category also drives home the um the fragility of the current system so i think it should be the case that we have universal insurance and that would be but even short of that we should have medicare open to people who want to continue or medicaid at the very least open to people who want to continue working um, but who have disabilities and then i think that's more than enough on that topic i just say I, I probably have missed a lot because it's an area where i feel like i'm still learning but it seems to me that we have what we've seen here is a revolution in our understanding of disability but continuing sort of stagnation in the structure of our benefits well, it's obviously an extremely complex web of issues. And uh, like a bowl of spaghetti, you can't pick up just one uh, noodle and, uh, and try to deal with the whole bowl. So um, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't ask you about um, gig workers, um, non-employer workers. And uh, I don't know if you've uh, done extensive study of how uh, there's been a risk shift for gig workers uh, in the U.S. versus the rest of uh, the world. But uh, specifically, let me ask whether you think gig work is growing um, in the United States and if that is putting at uh, even more risk uh, workers that, that have no protections whatsoever. It's a great question. And I would say that we have had difficulty you know classifying and studying gig work um and the next panel will be the next set of panelists are, are experts in this area so i look forward to hearing their reflections um but i i think that the gig there's no question in my mind that if we understand the gig economy broadly uh, to be not just people who work on employment platforms like Uber or TaskRabbit uh, or Instacart, but also people who are working in worlds that are coordinated uh, digitally and or are requiring um, that are treating the, and they're treating their workers as contract as contract workers rather than as full employees. That it's it's a really very large um, part of the labor market and it's a growing part. And the central issue here, as I see it, is really I mean it's really quite simple, right? That um, when you allow workers, uh, when you allow employers to treat a category of workers as um, as as not being employed, then you basically create this enormous hole in the American structure of social protection. Right? We have a system that, for better or worse, is organized around a definition of work that, again, is dated and. Um, and that a lot of the benefits that we take for granted as workers, whether it's protections against wage theft or uh, minimum hours or wage standards, do not exist for people who exist who, who work in this realm. And I think one particularly kind of pernicious aspect of the gig, of the gig economy, under, if we understand that to be this broad thing, is that it is, it is, it is not just like it is a sort of hyper hyperactive hyperactive version of the risk shift right so the idea is that it's not just and it's valorized sometimes as that like you have complete flexibility but but in in, in a really deep sense right it, it's saying to people like you're on your own and you have to be able to provide these benefits um yourself and the the reality is is that like that's not possible for many of the fundamental risk protections that, that people have um and and there's no better example of this in unemployment insurance so when the pandemic unemployment insurance 
measures were expanded to include gig workers, it made clear the lie that we couldn't actually figure out a way to make these workers part of our system of social protection. That, that it, it really showed that we could do this, but we're not willing to do it, uh, or at least our leaders are not. And I personally think that um, a lot of these sectors would not be as attractive to employers if they didn't have this character, right? But I, I also think like these are the, the, the aspects of the job that get valorized do not require the, the aspects of the job that are really problematic. So yes, if, 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 if flexible work is really something that workers want and they want to be able to you know, pick up and do stuff whenever they want, that can be combined with having access to health insurance and uh, unemployment insurance and a, and, and a, and a, a retirement pension. Um, and if we're not willing to do that in the employment market, then we should at least recognize that our system of social protection is inadequate and expand public programs to make sure that people have the protections they need. Great. I have another question for you. This comes from Alejandra Demenzian. Dem uh, how do immigrant workers fit in? I'm wondering about downward pressure on wages due to millions of workers in mixed status families facing immigration related retaliation. The fact that they have no or limited access to social safety nets, many work in the informal economy. That's kind of uh, tagging on to what you just talked about, but can you address immigrant workers in particular? Yeah, I really appreciate the question, especially the way it's framed. Right, because I think too often when we talk about well immigrant workers, we're talking about oh we can't have the Affordable Care Act be available for for people who are not legally working here, um, as if it's just a problem, right? That you know, and mostly a political problem. Whereas we really should be thinking about okay, well what what is happening to our labor market because we rely so heavily on on immigrant workers um, who uh, who are sometimes without documentation. So. To me, the there are two there are two things to say. One is that um, you know the, there there should be a way to incorporate people who are not um, uh, citizens into many social protection forms of social protection. And the it's not an easy task, but I just want to say, like on the table that that put on the table that there, there lots of countries have had to grapple with this, and they've come up with means, but to make sure that people who are living in a country are protected, um, at least against major, major risks. And, and there's obviously a self interest there, right, which is, you know, as and we see this during a pandemic, you want people to have basic health services, you want people to have their kids to be able to go to school, um, and not have to be um, uh, uh, not not be out running around during the day, and so on, right. So but the second thing I would say, and this is, uh, is that the, the uh, there is a portion of the economy, I think, that is heavily dependent on low wage non white labor, some of it immigrant labor, some of it not, that um, that is really resisted um, serious scrutiny or reform. And this was something that I thought was really a very encouraging aspect of the discussion of, of the care infrastructure during the, the last year. And, um, and, but I think we've sort of left it there. So many of these workers it's a it's a it, there's a their vulnerability is essentially the flip side of our unwillingness to to flip relatively simple policy switches so you know with medicaid um a lot of the home care work is paid for by medicaid we could have minimum standards we could make sure that we're creating um that we're creating um uh you know renew, relatively remunerative jobs for the people who preserve who perform them that have pathways to advancement. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that we allow enormous amounts of, um, of employer uh, pun in, uh, violation of existing law. Um, so I know there's difficult questions there because I obviously uh, wouldn't want to see an effort to crack down employers become something that, we, that was creating a, a, you know, a fearful environment. But at the same time, you know, people are basically um, paying into many public programs. Employers are essentially uh, able to um, pressure these workers for much lower wages because of their fear of um, of deport of detection and, and de deportation. And so that's just not a good thing to have in a labor market, right? So we've got like a black, a shadow labor market within a shadow labor, a low wage you know, a difficult low wage labor market that within it has a shadow labor market that really puts pressure downward uh, on standards and encourages employers to act in really kind of, I think, uh, fundamentally antisocial ways. Um, so I would, I would also just say that I feel like this is one where 
like on disability policy, where I'm learning an enormous amount. So I want to just say, if anybody <laughs> feels like I missed something fundamental, you should definitely uh, weigh in. Um, but I think it's um, I think it's an area that we should be really confronting. And like like many others, I've spent the last year um, just really thinking about what areas of my work were kind of blind to these realities um, that involve the intersection of race and economic disadvantage. And uh, there are many, and I'm, I'm trying to learn more, but uh, I still have a way to go. That's terrific. Unfortunately, we're all out of time and uh, we did manage to get uh, a few other questions, but yeah. uh, we can, can, we can uh, communicate those to you at some uh, later time. And, uh, we really appreciate all the insights that you've given us today. Uh, very, very important issues that you've brought up. And thank you so much for kicking off uh, this two-day conference with such important information. Thank you, Dr. Hacker. Thank you so much, everyone. And this is a wonderful event. I'm so glad you guys are, are putting it together. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you.